It is now my great pleasure and honor to present to you the 2016 commencement speaker, Megan Smith. Hello. So uh, thank you, President McCartney and uh, Chairman, Chairman Eviard. To the members of the Board of Trustees and to Pro, uh, Provost Rao, where are you? Um, to the amazing Smith alumni, to the honors, honorands, you call them the honorands, uh, and the honored guests, to the incredible parents and family who surround the class. Thank you for having me and faculty. You know, congratulations, class of 2016. I feel a little bit like I'm at a family reunion. <laughs> you know, it's not everywhere you can go where you could get customized family uh, holiday gifts in the bookstore. <laughs> or where people do lovely debugging of water. That was great. I love the engineering up here. But uh, you know, seriously, the class of 2016, you are amazing. I've been following you a bit, and I have an insider, uh, Jamie Keeney, who's uh, in the White House. Yeah, there we go. She's in the White House Council of Economic uh, Advisors, and so she's been giving me a little bit of inside information on you. <laughs> you know, you come from across the world. You come from right here. Some of you have a long line of heritage, you know, with your mothers with sisters, with aunts, with grandmothers, with great-grandmothers, and you can become Smithies with them, and that's an incredible connection. Some of you are new to Smith this, with your generation, and some of you are the first uh, in, your, in your family to graduate. So on this incredible day, I want to talk to you about three things. The first, I want to talk to you about confidence. I want to then talk to you about interconnection uh, and new approaches to solving challenges in the world and collaboration. And the third, I want to talk about intensity because that feels like a very smithy word. <laughs> Passion. And, you know, I want to get to the roots of things, the roots of challenges and also the roots of opportunities because sometimes there's symptoms and there's roots and I really encourage you to look for the roots because that's where the real change happens. And I love history. History informs so much of my thinking. So let's start with confidence. Confidence is a word that I came across in a document from a very long time ago. And then it was in a context that really surprised me and pointed to some roots. Confidence. Confidence in how you see yourself in the world. Confidence to take action. Confidence to break molds. Confidence to be your true self. It was in a document written by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, just a few hundred miles from where we are right now. It was start of a, another summer it was the start of the summer of 1848. Today we learn that Elizabeth Cady Stanton was a suffragist, an abolitionist, an activist, a strategist, so highly accomplished. When, and before she was written into the history books, she was a young person like all of you. It's especially relevant to talk about Elizabeth today because she so desperately wanted to go to college. How, can you imagine what she would think looking at all of you today? So um, her, when she was younger, her older brother died while he was at university. Um, he was their only, oldest, all of her brothers died before they um, reached adulthood. She was trying to console her father and she told him she would be all she could be and all he could say was that he wished she was a boy. This was devastating to her. As a girl, of course, in those days she was barred from traditional colleges, but luckily she was able to attend the Troy Female Seminary and it was one of the very first schools to allow women to get secondary and some college education. And it really, uh, Emma Willard, its founders, is very much like Sophia Smith. We celebrate your founder, Sophia Smith, for her vision to give women educational opportunities equal to men. Let's fast forward to now from that schooling to the summer of 1848 to Seneca Falls Convention, the first ever women's rights convention. <laughs> For those who have studied women's history or proper uh, American history, you will know many details of that. <laughs> exactly. I call March uh, Women's Missing History Month because I learn so much every month in March about all the people who are missing. But in, it's, uh, it's in Seneca Falls that I found that confidence uh, document. 
You know, she, she wrote the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women, she added, are created equal. And she writes sentiments in, and I really encourage you to read it if you haven't. There are 16 sentiments, and they're written in the spirit of our American revolutionary founders as they wrote against King George. In this case, the same language, repeated injuries and usurpations. Let the facts be submitted to a candid world. Of the 16 sentiments, there are many things, including equal pay, access to the vote, access to public office, uh, marriage and divorce laws, etc. full equality. But it's the very last sentiment that I want to focus on with you because she writes about confidence and she says, he has endeavored in every way that he could to destroy her confidence in her own powers, to lessen her self-respect and make her willing to lead a dependent and abject life. It is important to note the appearance and the insight in this document of, of confidence because it speaks to us, to that truth, to that need, to that need for confidence as a fundamental root to what will be the future of equality and it's so relevant today. As the United States Chief Technology Officer, my job is to advise the President and his team how to harness the power of data, innovation, and technology on behalf of the American people and the world. And one of the things we think about in doing that is really how do we unlock talent, the talent of all of the American people, field the whole team. One of the best ways to unlock talent is to have creative confidence. Class of 2016, we want you to have creative confidence because you have deep talents and now you have extraordinary training and our world needs your confidence and we need to, you to bring whatever innovations it is that you will bring to us. We have made great progress as a country on this continuum to get to those words, get to live up to those ideals of the documents that were written by our founders, but we still have a ways to go. There is so much bias that still lives against women, against uh, minorities, against people of color, against LGBT people, against people who would think differently. There are many ways that we're working to remove barriers. And one of the ways around confidence is around storytelling. Your amazing alum, Gloria Steinem, says, women have always been an equal part of the past, just not part of history. Smith has been a leader in recovering and preserving these stories. I was able to spend some time in your incredible archives yesterday. They are awesome. I will tell you that the Declaration of Sentiments, the document itself, like much of women's history, is also missing. The US archivist David Ferriero and I have launched a treasure hunt. It's our uh, Nicolas Cage kind of moment. <laughs> Hashtag find the sentiments. We're looking for it so it can have its, its rightful place in the US National Archives. Last week I was able to visit the set of a new film called Hidden Figures. This is an amazing film about the moonshot days of President Kennedy and NASA. It's so incredible to have astronaut Stephanie Wilson on the stage with us as we celebrate NASA. The film chronicles the story of three African-American elite mathematicians who were an integral part of the space race of the 60s. Last year, President Obama uh, awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest honor in our country for civilians, to Katherine Johnson. Katherine Johnson is one of the main members of the film. She is the African-American woman who was born on Equality Day two years before women got the vote in this country, who calculated the trajectories for Alan Shepard, the first American in space, John Glenn, the first American around the planet, and the Apollo mission to the moon. I have not, yes. I have not seen many Hollywood movies that show any elite mathematical African-American women in the Apollo stories, and Catherine did it, and that's changing. Recently, the Treasury Department made an incredible announcement that women will join currency. So, Treasury Secretary Liu, working very closely with U.S. Treasury Re Rosie Rios, have done that work to bring, uh, and by the way, if you have a bill in your pocket, you probably have it signed by Treasury Rios. She's about to hit a trillion dollars of signings. <laughs> they work together to activate the buildings on the back of, of the funds, and so you see the $5 bill uh, with, of course, the Lincoln Memorial now celebrating, to be celebrating Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Marion Wright, and Eleanor, who were there. In the spring, President Obama dedicated the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument in Washington, D.C., which protects the iconic long-term home of the National Women's Party, located just adjacent to Congress on Capitol Hill, strategically placed there by its founder, Alice Paul who organized many things, including the 1913 Parade for Suffrage down Pennsylvania Avenue, 
where 5,000 women marched and half a million spectators joined. Many people don't know about this parade, but it included Helen Keller. It included Ida B. Wells, the celebrated journalist and data scientist. And I thank you, Smith, for adding data scientists to your majors. It's the first public event of the Deltas, who were founded at Howard University. And people walked for months to get there. The parade ends at the grand steps of treasury. And now, on the $10 bill, on the grand steps of treasury, we will see the women of suffrage and the women of equality on our bills with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Sojourner Truth, her speech ain't a woman, delivered two years after Seneca Falls, Susan B. Anthony, and Alice Paul. I love that it's a group of leaders because uh, my friend Dylan McGee, who makes the Makers film, once asked Gloria Steinem uh, to make a documentary about Gloria, and Gloria said, you can't make a film about the women's movement about one woman. And so uh, I call on Susan B. Anthony's words from 1902, who she talked about the galaxy of women. The Maker series illustrates that, and Abby Wambach's most recent uh, uh, Maker film was just launched. I encourage you to go see it. These are important histories and we need to keep them. So the thing that I pull from 1848 is that the confidence point is a serious universal challenge. We have to make sure that we're working on that because the microaggressions, conscious and unconscious bias, overt and subtle discrimination uh, that we get all the time for men and women is unacceptable. We need to change that. The, the, the president established the Council of Women and Girls in his, one of his first acts in office, and they've got to it on the agenda, working on equal pay, family leave, and so many critical rights. I'm so proud of the Vice President's leadership, focusing on changing culture around sexual assault. He spearheads the In It's On Us campaign, uh, working on to eliminate sexual violence on campus, working on ending violence against women across our planet. Last year, the President hosted the first ever White House Demo Day. That's where we celebrate entrepreneurs. And what we did with this particular one was we focused on inclusive entrepreneurship. Today, we have a challenge in the country because growth capital, only 3% goes to women-led companies and only 1% to African-American-led companies. And 70% is going to just three states in our country. We need to spread that out because there's equal talent everywhere and we're working on that. So I encourage you to tap your confidence and come in uh, to this entrepreneurial world with all that you have. The second topic I want to talk to you about is about interconnection and how connected our world is. We want to use all the keys on the keyboard. And in, with Smithies, you are trailblazers. You are leaders. And I love Smith College because with Sophia's founding, with the founding of Smith College, we're bringing half of humanity in and working together. So my first part of interconnection has to do with interconnection of people. Life is a team sport. I was lucky to uh, learn from Alan Kay, who was a director of Xerox Park. He was a professor of ours. And one of the things he really coached us on, which I really encourage you to do, you don't have to be great at every single thing. You just have to find friends and colleagues who are great at the things that you're maybe not as interested in. And team up, team up. That's the way it works. You know, in teams, uh, and a lot of times our media celebrates that single founder, but really it's teams who do everything. I know that from all of my work in Silicon Valley. One of my favorite uh, people who's not well known is, you know, the Wright brothers. Well, there's Catherine Wright, one of the Wright sisters. And uh, Catherine, she was not the inventor of flight, but she was part of that team. And she would get all of her fellow school teachers and they'd run out to the fields and they were part of the operational leadership of discovering and creating flight in this country. And she was often the chief, uh, like a COO for her brothers. I was just in South Africa two weeks ago for the Open Government Partnership, and it's so exciting to see how we in countries are starting to collaborate with each other to open up transparency and better serve people. Today, there's a hackathon in DC on Hack the Pay Gap. We can work in new ways. Uh, one of my favorite examples of how we can solve things by scouting for talent that's out there was a thing that we did with the United Nations. The United Nations, uh, how many people know about the Sustainable Development Goals? Do you guys know about that? Yes. Yeah. So last year, the UN met uh, during the General Assembly to ratify the next 15 years, 17 goals for us that have to do with water quality, they have to do environmental issues, justice, equality, uh, access to employment, etc. These are really incredible goals with 15-year targets. What we were able to do with the UN is bring together a group of people to post on the web a call 
Instead of just ratifying and then beginning, we said, why don't we start within the first hour? We put out a call to the world and asked whether folks had solutions already in progress, and the world responded with 800 uh, submissions of, of proposals that they were already working on from 100 countries. I want to just share a few of them because uh, uh, a group selected 14 of them come mini, to come give mini TED-style talks. And so there was a group that was using drones to plant a billion trees a year to deal with re deforestation. There was a group that was in Uganda that was teaching law in prison so that prisoners who have almost no representation there because of lack of resources could get themselves out of prison. There's a group that's building a floating fab lab makerspace in the Amazon for the people who live there. There's a group of people, there's a, a guy who has two million listeners in Nigeria who's building cold hubs for market storage. So think Airbnb for tomatoes. <laughs> these are really creative ideas and they're out there. And my point in telling you these stories is each of you have fabulous ideas if you help each other. Really be the venture capitalists and the colleagues and the, and the smart generalists like Catherine Wright for her brothers. Go do those things for each other. And I want you to remember to include technology in your thinking. And that's the second part of interconnection that I wanted to talk about, which is the universe doesn't divide the subjects. We divide them at school, but it really doesn't. And what I love about Smith College is that you have added engineering and computer science. <laughs> And it isn't that engineering and computer science and these are any better than any other subjects. They just happen to be equal to the subjects. And it's not fair that women's colleges haven't included those, uh, those subjects. And I really applaud your faculty uh, for adding that for all of you. I have had a great career of using science and technology to try to make the world a better space. And I am excited for you all and those of you who are choosing to do that and those who will collaborate with you. You know, we, we would never graduate from high school and say, Reading, you know, writing, that really wasn't my thing. But people all day say math and science weren't their thing. Right? That's not good. We need to figure out how to have that creative confidence about everything and have TQ, like IQ and EQ for everyone. We've launched Computer Science for All and other projects like that. And I want to note that Alison Bechtel is here, and I know many people are familiar with the Bechtel test. When, yeah. Amazing. To really raise our awareness of gender inequality in media, we've started a project in the White House Office of Science Technology Policy called Image of STEM. And it's a very similar challenge. Who gets depicted on screen for who does science and tech? Uh, Gina Davis did groundbreaking measurement work, and she found that on screen for our children, it's 15 to 1 boy programmers to girl programmers that we animate or cast. We don't even realize we're doing it. It's unconscious bias. We need to change that. Many people don't know that some of the fundamental founders of technology and computer science are women. So for example, Ada Lovelace. She's Lord Byron's poet math daughter, the first person on the planet to think of the idea of algorithms and computing in that form. Grace Hopper, the rear admiral of the Navy. How many people know Grace Hopper? A handful, yes. Grace Hopper is an Edison level American who invented computer languages. She is amazing, and I encourage you sometime to go to the conference named for her, where 15,000 women computer scientists gather. Some people may have seen the film Imitation Game, which chronicles Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park is where uh, the world cracked the Enigma codes uh, for the Nazis, and really, one of the things I had a chance to visit there, and I met a woman. She had been five years old at the park. And she said uh, her mom was always trying to keep them quiet because they lived in the stables area next to Dilly Knox, who was one of the great leaders there in math, and next to the elite math team. I want you to think in your mind about an elite math team for a sec. What her mom used to say to these four loud children, shh, the girls are working. <laughs> the girls are working. Those girls saved 11 million lives and shortened the war by two years with their male colleagues. Together, that was heroic engineering. It gives me chills to think about the girls working. And I want you to think about using tech in that way. So there's an expression, and that gets me to a very quick final point that I want to make to you about intensity, which I love about you. <laughs> there's this expression. The expression is where your heart's greatest gladness meets the world's greatest need. I was lucky uh, to take uh, acoustics from none other than Professor Bose, like Bose the speakers. <laughs> he was so cool. And he, uh, 
He would say to us, you know, you guys are great. You're hard workers. You got it down. If you can figure out what you are so passionate, obsessed, and intense about, you will be unstoppable. And so that's my third point to you, is that take that Smith intensity that you came here with already, that your faculty and your peers and your colleagues have helped you really sharpen and hone, and really take that with you. And the skills mix each other, be inspired by each other, build with each other. And like most, path, most of the paths that all of us have taken, you know, we're not sure exactly what will happen. It's unpredictable, but I do predict that it will be extraordinary. So congratulations to all of you, and welcome to the powerful alumni, alumni of Smith College. Thank you.